Hello. Welcome to Worship at Medicine Street United Methodist Church. I am Harriet Bryan, and we are thrilled that you chose to worship with us, whether you are worshiping with us in our sanctuary or you're worshiping with us online. Now, as Methodists, we are known for being methodical, and that means we keep good records, and we report on all sorts of things, including who we were honored to have worship with us. So, I'm going to ask if you are sitting in the sanctuary, you're at the inner aisle, if you'd find one of those row books, those record of worship books, and you would sign in, pass it down the pew, and pass it back so we have a record of your having been here. And if you're trying to remember the name of that person on the pew that just is on the tip of your tongue, this will also help you know who's sitting on that pew with you. If you're worshiping online, we ask that you would take just a moment and fill out that digital attendance card. We, again, would like to be able to connect with you, and that's one of the best ways that we know to do that. Now, I have a number of questions for you. Do you consider yourself a wise person? Do people ask you for advice? How do you make decisions when you have a difficult decision to make? That's going to be what we're going to address a little bit later in the service, so you can just let those thoughts percolate in the back of your mind as we prepare to worship God together. But first, I invite you to take a deep breath, knowing that you are in the presence of God and God's people. Smile at someone nearby. If you already have, you can do it again. Mother Teresa, St. Teresa, once said that peace begins with a smile, and goodness knows the world needs more peace. So now, as those who are aware of God's presence, let us worship God together. you stand and join me in our call to worship that is found in your bulletin. Let us turn our ears toward wisdom. 
and stretch our eyes toward understanding. If we seek for it like silver and search for it like hidden treasure, then we will understand the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. Will you join me in our opening hymn? Gracious and loving God, give us wisdom greater than our own. Free us from wanting to make the right decision more than we want to be righteous people, from wanting to be known as wise people more than we want to know you. Free us from the idolatry of assuming there's only one perfect choice in any given situation and from making decisions primarily for our comfort and others' approval or fear of their disapproval. Remind us that good choices do not always lead to the easiest outcomes, especially at first. Free us from second and 22nd guessing our decisions. Help us to listen to you and trust you with all our decisions. Amen. Our Hebrew scripture reading this morning comes from the book of First Kings and speaks to the succession of Solomon to the throne from David We'll be reading, I'll be reading from 1 Kings 2, 10 through 12, and then 3, 3 through 14. Then David slept with his ancestors and was buried in the city of David. The time that David reigned over Israel was 40 years. He reigned seven years in Hebron and 33 years in Jerusalem. So Solomon sat on the throne of his father David, and his kingdom was firmly established. And then reading from chapter 3, verses 3 through 14. Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of his father David. Only he sacrificed and offered incense at the high places. The king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the principal high place. Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I should give you. And Solomon said, 
You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept him for him this great and steadfast love and have given him a son to sit on his throne today. And now, O Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, although I am only a child. I do not know how to go out or come in, and your servant is in the midst of the people whom you have chosen, a great people, so numerous they cannot be numbered or counted. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil, for who can govern this, your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this, and God said to him, Because you have asked this and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, I now do according to your word. Indeed, I give you a wise and discerning mind. No one like you has been before you, and no one like you shall arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor all your life. No other king shall compare with you. If you will walk in my ways, keep my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your life. Our gospel reading is from the book of John. I'll be reading John 6, 51 through 58. I'll ask you to stand as you're able for the reading of the gospel. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them, just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father. So whoever eats this because of the Father, whoever eats will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate, and they died. But the one who eats this bread will live forever. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated.
At this time, we invite forward our children and or youth for a special time of the blessing of the backpacks and the keys, followed by our next children's moment. So we'll ask you just to come and stand for a moment. We'll have you stand right here. Don't sit yet. You can sit in a second. Come on down. We welcome you for this time. And I will say, if we have any youth that feel like you're too cool to come up here, stand where you are, please, so that we can pray over you and your backpack, too. I see a couple of y'all still sitting. Love it. They're still coming. Uh -huh. Always room for more. If you have your backpack this morning, this will be a special blessing on your backpack. If you don't, that's okay. We can still bless your backpack without that's it right. being here. And we have backpack tags that we have for you that you'll get today. And youth on the chancel rails, there are tags for your keys or your backpacks as well if you want to grab those. God, bless this school year, this new season, this chance to discover the world anew. We sense the anticipation of something about to happen, of all our preparation and worry and excitement for new friendships and challenges and opportunities. God, bless these backpacks, these symbols of a fresh beginning, and bless every child who carries their heavy load as all the new questions rise up in their hearts and minds. God, we also ask that you bless these keys, their drivers, and especially the new drivers. Accompany them on all journeys, short and long, for work, for school, for relationships, for family, for mission, for all destinations. God, bless this new environment and everyone in it, the teachers and professors who ready their classrooms, creating opportunities for learning and belonging, the administrators and staff as they stretch hearts and minds and feel their own stretching too. The parents and caregivers who carry the weight of loving, protecting, and raising these kids. God bless all who begin this journey of a new year. With every step they take, may they feel your presence and hear you say, I see you. I am with you. You are loved. Each and every one. Amen. Amen. And you are loved, each and every one. Could I ask you now to turn and be seated for our Next Gen Kids moment? We are glad you are here today. Hope everyone has gotten off to a nice start of the school year. I am starting with a very important question for you. If God said to you tomorrow, ask me for anything you want, and I'll give it to you. What would you ask God for? What would you ask God for, Noah? A phone. A phone. Okay. What would you ask God for, Olivia? An engineering degree. Ooh. Okay. What would you ask God for, John? A, mil a million what? A million dollars. A million dollars. What would you ask God for, Henry? A TV. A TV. Okay. Zion? Nothing? A spiders, spiders, okay. What would you ask God for, Grace? Peace to the world. There you go. It, it's hard to think about just having free reign, asking for whatever you want. If you heard the scripture that Pastor Tim read this morning, he talked about a man in the Bible named Solomon. Can you say Solomon? Solomon. And God basically said to Solomon, ask for whatever you want. You want to know what Solomon asked for? Wisdom. Wisdom. He could have asked for anything, and he asked for wisdom. He could have asked for a million dollars. He could have asked for a phone. He could have asked for a TV. He could have asked for spiders. But he asked for wisdom. 
And Solomon asked for wisdom because Solomon knew that he was about to have to make some really tough decisions. And he wanted to be sure that whatever decisions he made, he made them according to what God wanted him to do. And you know, the truth is, all of our lives need to be that way. When we're making decisions, the first thing we need to do is check with God and ask God for God's wisdom and God's will in showing us what God wants us to do. I want to show you something this morning. I brought with me some ketchup. Yep, just a little packet of ketchup. And I just want to pretend for a moment that this little picket, packet of ketchup is you. You're just out there in the world, flopping around, doing your thing, hanging out, having a good time. And sometimes when we're on our own like this, we don't always do the best things or make the best decisions or do what we're supposed to do. But I want to show you something else. What if I take that same packet of ketchup and I just put it in a bottle of water like this. Now I want you to just pretend for just a minute that this bottle of water is God and this packet of ketchup is you. Because see, in our lives, we really need to be thinking about are we waiting to see what God's going to do for us or are we waiting to see what God's going to do through us? So as we're thinking about being with God and being in God's will and seeking wisdom and seeking discernment, when we're completely surrounded by God, one of the things that can start to happen is when we talk to God, we can begin to move in God's will. And God shows us when to move, when to pause, when to go a different direction. If you can't see this, what's happening is when God says move, the packet moves within God. God's surrounding. Now, notice the packet couldn't do this if it wasn't surrounded by God. Moving through God, moving in God's will. Whoa, that's right. So we need to be seeking God in all that we do. Because you see, God did not design this world so that God could rule independently of us. God designed this world so that God could rule through us. So this week at school or going about your day, I want you to think about how are you seeking God's help in making your decisions? How are you seeking God's help in things that you have to do each day? I want us to ask God for wisdom to help us have that discernment to make those decisions. Can you say a blessing with me today? Let's pray. You, you do? You have some friends at your school? Good. I'm glad. Let's pray together. May we always seek God's wisdom. Amen. Thank you.
You may be seated. Some of you know that we had a funeral here yesterday for one of the pillars of the church. It was a glorious celebration of a life well lived. Now, what you may and may not know is I've been in this area for so long that I'm friends with just about everybody who works at any funeral home in Clarksville. And so one of the folks who was here from Reynolds Nave Larson had peeked at our bulletin for today and saw that the sermon title was, How Do I Know God's Will? And he asked me, Harriet, are you in the middle of a series? And I was like, no, it's one sermon. And he looked at me and he said, this isn't a series, you're one sermon about how you discern God's will. And I said, oh, you just don't know how smart the people of Madison Street are. One sermon's all it takes. It made me think of the story that some of you may remember of the little girl who was drawing a picture, and she was just so intent on her drawing that when her mother called her to supper, she didn't show up. And so mom sent dad to go get her so the meal didn't get cold. Dad went and found her, and he said, didn't, asked her, didn't you hear your mother calling you? And she said, yes, yes, I just want to finish this drawing. And he asked her, well, honey, what are you drawing? And she said, I'm drawing a picture of God. And he said, sweetheart, nobody knows what God looks like. And she said, well, they will when I'm finished. <laughs> so when I am finished, and guess what? Today has sermon has 15 points. <gasps> so make yourselves comfortable. Really, it's, it's going to go fast, I promise. But I have always loved this story of Solomon asking God for wisdom, when Solomon could have asked God for anything. Now, growing up, I had a Bible. My sister and I had a Bible in our bedroom that we shared that makes this Bible look really small. It was one of those great big picture books, and it had all sorts of fun color illustrations in it. Not one of the, the small little illustrated ones, but, you know, big. And the story that follows the story that Pastor Tim read is of a display of Solomon's wisdom. Some of you may remember this story from long ago, but this picture book that I had had it all drawn out. I can still see it in my mind's eye. That two women came to Solomon seeking justice. They'd been sharing a room together. They had given birth within three days of each other, and one of the babies had died. And in the middle of the night, one of the women claimed that the woman whose baby had died came and stole her baby, and so that was still alive. And so both were claiming the child. And they asked Solomon to decide who was the mother of this child. And Solomon listened, and then he called for a sword to be brought to him. And he said, the way that I know to make this decision is I'm going to take this sword and I'm going to slice this baby in two. And one mother gets half and the other mother gets half. And that way each of you will have a part of this child. Well, one of the women immediately cried out, no, 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 King Solomon, please let the other woman have the baby. And he said, that is the mother of the child because she wants the child to live, whereas the other woman had already lost a child, and she was like, well, I can't have one. She shouldn't have one either. And Solomon was right, and everybody marveled at how wise King Solomon was. So how do we become wise? How do we make decisions that are in alignment with God's will for our lives? That's really the question is those who have been baptized, we know that our purpose in life is to serve God and to make God visible in the world. But how do we go about doing that? I've always been drawn to the work of St. Ignatius, when it comes to making decisions. And some of you have asked me for advice, and I have been known to boil this down to three questions instead of 15 points. But here goes with a story about St. Ignatius. Now, St. Ignatius 
lived in the latter part of the 1400s and the early 1500s. He began life as a soldier, and during the invasion, or um, he was at present at an attack at a castle, he had a cannonball go through his legs and shatter his legs. Been reset, didn't look good to him. He wasn't going to look good in those courtly tights that men wore in those days. So he asked them to re-break his leg and set it so it would look better and women would find him more attractive. He's lying in his bed convalescing, and he asks for romance novels to be brought to him to pass the time because he's got a lot of time on his hands. Well, the castle where he was convalescing did not have a single romance novel, but they had a copy of the life of Christ and a copy of the life of saints. And they said, here you go, Ignatius. Here is your reading material. And so he began to read these books, and he was bored. So he supplemented his reading with an active fantasy life, imagining himself as the dashing warrior once again, serving some unidentified courtly lady and having great exploits. And he also spent his time, after reading these books, fantasizing about what it would be like to commit his life to God, to turn everything over and to serve God and to become a monk. And over the course of time, he realized that after his daydreams of glamour and valor, he was excited as he dreamt, as he fantasized, and then he always felt sort of flat and depressed. But when he fantasized about serving God, after he did so, he noticed that he was filled with joy and hope. And over time, he came to this realization, this belief that God speaks to us in our interior mind, hearts, and thoughts, that God desires to give us wisdom. James 1, 5 says, if any of you lacks wisdom, ask God and God will give it to you. And so Ignatius developed some guidelines. Now, he was not naive enough to believe that every thought that we have comes from God. He recognized that there is what he calls the enemy of human nature that would lead us astray, which is why discernment and asking God for wisdom is so very important. There are three... Um, observations that Ignatius made about discernment. And the first is discernment is always choosing between two goods. It's never a choice between something that is good and something that is bad. So if we are trying to decide whether to cheat on a test or cheat on a spouse, that's not a question for discernment. Just don't do the thing that you know that you shouldn't do. That was Ignatius's point. But the second point is that discernment only makes sense when we have a personal relationship with God. When we love somebody, we want to do something that will please them. And if we love God and that's our heart's desire, then God is going to honor our request for wisdom and for discernment. And then the third observation that Ignatius made about discernment is that it is often a struggle. It can be difficult. Again, there's that enemy of human nature. We have our false self. We have pride. We have our egos. We have our inability to trust, our desire to hold on to control. There are all sorts of things that make it difficult for us really to say to God, please guide me. I will do what you want for me to do. And so... Ignatius also observed that there are three types of people. There are those who are all talk and no action. They say that they're going to do what God wants them to do, that that's who they want to be, but they are just so consumed busyness, they never get around to taking the time that they need to listen to God speak to them. Then secondly, Ignatius observed that there are conditional Christians 
And those are the ones who put conditions on what God can do. God, I need to choose a career, and I will do whatever you want me to do as long as it keeps me in an upper-middle-class lifestyle. You get the picture. So those who want to say, I am yours if you meet my conditions that I've already come up with. And thirdly, Ignatius said, there's the person who's willing to completely surrender one's life to God and say, you created me, my life has purpose, and I will follow whatever it is that you want me to do, God. Makes me think of John Wesley's covenant prayer written some couple of hundred years later. It's a prayer that this many years in ministry, I have to tell you, friends, I still have a hard time praying sometimes because it starts off with, God, I am no longer my own but thine. Do with me what thou wilt. Let me be employed by thee or laid aside by thee. Put me to suffering, put me to doing. I mean, it just says, I surrender all. And it is a difficult prayer to mean in every aspect of our lives every day. I just want to acknowledge that. So if you think that I have it all together, well, like all of us, I am a work in progress. And guess what? Just like that, we've made it through six points of the sermon. See? It's not as bad as y'all thought it was going to be. So now, there are five basic attitudes that help us hear God speak. The first is an openness to hearing God speak. Now, I know that sounds obvious, and we've already touched on this, but there are those of us who are tempted to think, well, I've already made up my mind, um, so don't confuse me with the facts. Perhaps um, some of our students have already gone through this and decide where they're going to school, but God, it might sound like this, God, I will go wherever you want me to go to college as long as it is within an hour's drive of my parents' house or four hours or whatever, but you know, don't, don't confuse me with the facts, I know. No, we need the first prerequisite we're hearing from God is to be open. The second is oh so similar, but it is a generosity of spirit. It is, in effect, giving God a blank check and saying, my life is yours. Do with it what you will. Direct me, because it is only in you, O oh God, that I know that I will find the abundant life for which you created me. This leads us to our third attitude or quality, and that's courage. Friends, it is risky. It takes a lot of courage, really, to surrender our lives to God. Some of you know that I recently got a new car because of the hailstorm on May 8th, and the insurance company determined that my car had been totaled. And I really went back and forth. I ended up with the car that I have, but they had a five-speed that I wanted. I've always driven a manual, a stick shift, and my husband persuaded me to get the automatic because of the resale value. I did ask him for advice, um, but it made me think that one of my friends had observed probably pretty astutely some years ago, Harriet, the reason that you like to drive a stick shift so much is because you like being in control. Um, I think that's probably true. So it takes a lot of courage to say, God, I am yours. Do with me what thou wilt. And all of this only really happens and makes sense when we can be open, we can be generous with our lives, with that, have the attitude with God. We can ask God to give us courage. But if we habitually listen to God, if we have a time where we listen to God's guidance and seek God's guidance on a regular basis, it becomes easier and easier to discern where God is calling us and what God is calling us to do. And then all of this is built upon this idea of putting God first, of beginning with the end in mind, keeping God as the most important factor in making any decisions. What this looks like when we confuse the ends with the means is that maybe we value success or popularity 
or power or money over anything else. And then after we achieve our goals of success, we're like, well, okay, now I'm going to be able to make charitable donations. That will please God. Now I'm going to be able to volunteer my time. That will please God. Those things are true, but what God asks of us is to put God first and then let everything else fall into place. Wow, just like that. Six plus six, five, eleven. Friends, we only have four more to go. Now, this is the meat of the sermon. These are the four discernment techniques that we can use when we are faced with a decision that we are trying to make. And the first one Ignatius recommends is that we consider what advice we would give to a stranger because all too often we're better at giving advice to others than we are following it ourselves. I have sometimes heard that we might consider what advice would we give a best friend, what advice would we give to a loved one, but whatever it is, the first technique is to consider if someone else were in this situation and trying to make up their mind, what advice would I give? The second one is, according to Ignatius, is to picture ourselves either on our deathbed or we've just drawn our last breath and we're standing before Christ our judge and we're considering, well, what does Christ think? What does Jesus think about the decision that I just made? Now, I was, have to tell you, I was a little surprised when I read that that was Ignatius's exact advice because I've always heard a softened approach to that, which is, look back over your life and think what you're going to regret or what you're going to celebrate. Maybe do it five years from now, ten years from now. But man, Ignatius just cut to the quick and said, you're standing before Christ your judge. How are you going to answer? So that is the second technique that Ignatius recommended. And then the third, if you don't have clarity, is Ignatius said, now is the time to use your reason and weigh the pros and cons. Don't begin with that because that muddies everything. But if you still lack clarity, weigh the pros and cons and pray over that again. That's that habitual practice of prayer. And then fourthly, Ignatius advised that after you think you've made your decision, ask God for confirmation that you have made the right decision. And generally speaking, the right decision is accompanied by a feeling of rightness, of peace and joy and relief. There may be some anxiety because, again, it can be risky to follow God's leading, but if the decision is not the one that God would have us make, then we typically have feelings of heaviness and sadness and despair, and God is not asking us to go in that direction. You've been very patient in listening to all of this, and so now that you have, let me tell you, I've distilled this sermon into a series of two questions that you can find in your bulletin. I think maybe there are four questions, but two sets of questions based upon this interior monologue that we have with God of that Ignatius referred to as consolation and desolation, but the decision that I'm making, is it moving me to a place of peace, joy, and fulfillment, putting God first, or is it leading me to a place of emptiness and despair? Those original feelings that Ignatius had when he was fantasizing about his future. Friends, I begin every single day with a simple prayer. I pray more than this, but my first prayer of the day is always from James chapter 1, verse 5. God, grant me wisdom that is greater than my own because I know that I need it. Friends, that is a prayer. I'm not saying that I haven't made mistakes because goodness knows I have. We all have. But I tell you from personal experience, that is a prayer that God honors. When we ask God for wisdom, God answers. And may God make all of us wiser than we are. Amen.
I invite you to stand in body or spirit as we respond to the word of God read and proclaimed with our affirmation of faith. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all his works, and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as the divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in time of need. We believe that this faith should manifest itself in the service of love as set forth in the example of our blessed Lord to the end that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Amen. You may be seated. I want to remind you today as, I, as we do each Sunday that the pastors here at Madison Street United Methodist Church love to pray for you um, and especially any needs or prayer requests that you may have. So if you have one that you would like us to be specifically praying for, you can always send that to prayer at madisonstreetumc.org. We will share that within the pastors. If you would like it to go on our prayer list that um, comes out in the Friday email, you can let us know specifically, please share this in the prayer list, and we will get it on there. Knowing that God hears each and every one of the prayers that we bring before God, let us go to the Lord in prayer. God of knowledge and wisdom, we come before you today with the humility to admit to each other and to you that we do not always know the right or the best answer. Sometimes faced with two paths, we do not have what is needed to make the best decision. In these times of uncertainty, we come to you seeking your guidance. We give you thanks that you are with us, guiding us each moment into the future you prefer for us. God, we, al we also know that sometimes when we should come to you to seek guidance and wisdom, our own ego gets in the way. We don't think we need you. We ignore your guidance. In these times, help us acknowledge our own finite understanding so that we may lean on your infinite wisdom. Healing God, you have given so graciously to us a share of your understanding and knowledge. Through these gifts, we can prevent, cure, even eradicate certain diseases. We ask that you be with all those who are suffering today. May they feel the embrace of your healing spirit and the all-encompassing nature of your compassionate and peaceful presence. We give you thanks today and every day for the greatest revelation of your will and your love in the person of Jesus. May we strive to live up to his example. May we bring peace in the face of conflict. May we bring unity in the face of division. And may we carry with us an attitude of joyful service as we leave this time of worship to go back into the world into which you lead us daily. May we share the deep, abiding love of Christ with all we meet. So no one has to wonder if they are seen, heard, worthy, or loved. We pray all of this through the one who lived out your will and shared your wisdom most effectively, Jesus the Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, if you follow us on Facebook, you may have seen the photos of proud four-year-olds who were presented with their first Bible from Madison Street last week during our Promotion Sunday celebration. That's one of the things that your generosity makes possible. And now as we prepare to offer our gifts and ourselves to God, I want to remind you to please take time to fill out that time talent survey. We have hard copies available and we also have it available electronically.
Friends, if you are a guest of ours and you have never texted welcome to 931-740-1882, 931-740-1882, we ask that you would do so. We'd like to be able to connect with you and to follow up with you. If you're a guest of ours in our sanctuary and you've not stopped at our guest connection table, we ask that you would do that on your way out. It is on your right. There will be someone there who has a small gift and some information about Madison Street. We want to answer any questions that you might have. We try to have our website be our hub of information, madisonstreetumc.org. You can also follow us on Facebook, on Instagram. You can sign up to get our Friday email newsletter. Now, if you have just a few minutes today, I'd say 10 to 15, if you have never been next door and seen everything that happens over there, music lessons, crafts, drama, sewing, cooking, that means it's just absolutely amazing, then please, at the end of the worship service, come up here and meet with me. We're going to make, wait on Miss Brooke to come and We'll go over there and tour the Clarksville Youth Enrichment Program and the Music and Arts Academy. It is fantastic. You want to see this if you have not. I'm going to just keep saying that. Everyone who's been says, wow, I had no idea. So that is my major announcement. And I have to remind you that Back to Madison Street is coming up September 8th. We need you to register for that. We're also trying <laughs> there's an ice cream contest I think you all should have a seat for a second we have another announcement this morning it's going to take some focus uh, sorry Harriet we just had to interrupt you there That's not... <laughs> This is important stuff. I, and I asked Bo if we could just uh, make this announcement this morning. Bo, I, before I ask, I went, did you watch the Olympics? I did. did. Was there any particular feat or, or contest that you liked the best? I love Shakari. Sh what? Shakari. What? Uh, she's, she's an LSU girl. And watched what is, her win the silver. Oh, she won the she's silver. She's fast. And, and she was she running. Runs. She was running. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, uh, my, f my favorite uh, contest was the ice cream making contest at the Olympics. Did, did you see? There wasn't an ice cream at the Olympics. Oh, oh yeah, there was, there was. There was this guy named Scoop Dog, and he did this scoop. <laughs> and at the end of every, every event, Scoop Dog would come out, and my wife and I would go to the freezer, and, <laughs> and it, we would make choices about which ice cream we were going to have after that particular oh. event. Yeah, you didn't know about that. Part. I didn't. I missed yeah. out on that Well, one. we're going to continue that contest, actually, into back to Madison Street, which is the point of our announcement this morning. If you all will look in your order of worship in the next to the last page, there is a uh, QR code there, and we're going to need your help for this particular contest. And I need to ask before you look at that QR code, how many of you all have actually made homemade ice cream before? Would you raise your hands? Look at that. All right. Now, of those people that raised their hands, how many of you would raise your hands and say, I'm willing to bring some of that homemade ice cream on September 8th to back to Madison Street? Could I see those show of hands? All right, we got to up the ante here just a little bit, uh, Bo. What can we do to make this contest more contesting? We can um, bring out a major award. I will say it is fragile, so we're going to have to watch out. All right, what but do we the have? Major for... award for the contest is the Golden Scoop. The Golden Scoop. <laughs> the Golden Scoop. This would look great in any home. The white and black homes, the, the, the farm homes, yeah. uh, our home that's just covered in... Joanna toys. Gaines made that for us to have today. <laughs> yeah. Now, with that incentive of those people that raised their hands, how many now would be willing to bring us some ice cream? All right, we, got some, we, we have one hand. We've got work to do. Would you all please pray about this and on, uh, use that QR code 
We would like to have a contest on September the 8th, but we need ice cream in order for it to happen. So to register for it, you can either go to our website or you can use that QR code, takes you to the same place. And please register to be one of the contestants for our ice cream contest. So we'll have a good time on September 8th with this prize in the offing there, the Golden Scoop Dog Award. There we are, all right. Thank you all. Thank you, Harriet, for letting us, uh, us. Let's get back to the important stuff now, if you all would. <laughs> Our concluding hymn today is number 648, and it calls us all to be ministers. It, it refers to pastors, but you'll notice that Pastor Carl, uh, Carl Dahl says in the, uh, in the footnotes on that hymn, change that word from pastors to ministers, and that's what we're called to be uh, as we go from this place. Number 648, please join me as we stand to sing.
May we not forget to ask God for wisdom. May we put God first. And may we remember that out of all of the ways that God could choose to be made known in this world, God chooses to work through us as imperfect as we are. Thanks be to God. Amen.